the Columbia River Gorge. Spectacular place, famous for its wind, famous for its scenery. There's a lots of geology here too. There, there's a lots of geology. There's a lots of geology. Ninja. <laughs> Take five. Create the Columbia River Gorge? Lots of questions. We've got a few answers. Let's get busy. I'll just say, and what about Beacon Rock? <laughs> and what about Beacon Rock? Two more times. What about Beacon Rock? Or the old scenic Columbia River Highway? Was another one? Uh, human history. What about Beacon Rock? Or the human history with Lewis and Clark? Or building of the scene at Columbia River Highway? There's gobs of stuff here. I'll take that all the way up to gobs. <laughs> Hello, this is Nick Sentner in Ellensburg, Washington. Remembering Tom Foster feature videos. This is part two of a three-part series remembering the talents, the hard work, the amazing visual sense of Tom Foster, who passed away in March of 2020, suddenly, unexpectedly, at the age of 60. We miss him, and I hope that you were able to see part one, which was looking back at the two-minute geology videos that Tom and I created back in 2012 and 2013. This video is a continuation of the work that Tom and I did. And there's really two objectives. One is to continue to share his work. I don't know if you all have seen these, and many of you are very interested in the geology of Washington, so you should know about these videos if you don't. And so I've compiled them here for you. And secondly, I was very pleased with the first video, the reaction, the comments that were left by everyone. The comments down below the video and also the comments in the live chat that we had when we premiered the video on New Year's Eve. I was in a very good mood after that uh, premiere and I know that Tom's family and close friends and former co-workers will take great comfort in seeing all of your comments about recognizing Tom's abilities and um, just realizing how, how unique he was and how talented he was. And so part of that, part of those comments left last time involved his website, hugefloods.com. And that motivated me to go to that website. I haven't been there in a while, hugefloods.com. It still exists. And as I mentioned in the live chat, uh, it's a little unclear what the future of Tom's hugefloods.com will be. And I don't know if that website will continue for much longer. I really honestly don't know. And so I wanted to uh, do what I could uh, here to um, gather information about how we might save that website. Uh, and also... Uh, just make sure that you know uh, all of the resources that are available to you at Tom's website. There's not only the site itself, which is amazing, amazing photos and, and text. There's a, a blog, which uh, I've gone through and gathered a few of these photos from his, his uh, blog. If you don't know what a blog is, it's like an online diary. So he would go out with his, his nephew, uh, his niece, uh, his wife, Teresa, uh, he would incorporate them in his blog posts. And uh, I think at some point, Tom got a little discouraged that there weren't uh, lots and lots of readers of the blog. Um, but uh, in t typical Tom fashion, they were done very, very carefully uh, and very thoroughly. Uh, so I, I just want to send people, uh, as many people as possible, to hugefloods.com just so that you can enjoy his work. Uh, also his YouTube channel, uh, Huge Floods YouTube channel, which hosts all the videos that uh, I've uh, compiled for you here. And an Instagram page, which he began a little bit late, um, later. So um, 
to get us back into these programs, Tom was getting away from the two-minute geology format. He was going a little bit more specifically towards some of my uh, abilities, which is kind of more free-form and long-winded. And so we took a trip to Hawaii. Uh, we filmed there. Um, and then before you know it, we were into 15-minute videos, 30-minute videos. And I hope that you enjoy these programs by Tom Foster. Thank you for watching. Two minute geology, the two minute geology. Aloha, young people. The rain shadow effect on the big island of Hawaii. Rain shadows are dry areas on the back sides of mountains. The downwind side of a mountain, the mountain creates a shadow of dryness. We've got that here on the Big Island. It's the most famous place to study this effect. You can go wet side to dry side of this island in a 60 mile drive and go from Hilo side, which is more than 120 inches of annual precipitation, that's more than 10 feet by the way, of rain per year, up and over the saddle road to the Kona side of the island, which has less than 10 inches of rain a year. That's quite a transition. What is going on here? Here in the Pacific Northwest, we've got the same effect. Western Washington is famous for its rain. But there's a strikingly different landscape on the other side of the Cascades. Washington's the evergreen state, but half of it's ever brown. Okay, you want a rain shadow effect? You need three essential items. An ocean nearby, winds blowing steadily on shore, and a mountain range to block the traveling air mass. Here's how it works. Evaporation on the surface of the ocean creates moist air. Prevailing winds push the wet air inland until it hits the base of the mountains. The air is forced to rise, and as the air lifts, it expands and cools. Cooler air can't hold as much moisture, so clouds form, and it rains a bunch, resulting in a lush green landscape. The now dry air mass crosses the mountains and begins to sink on the leeward side of the range. It compresses and warms, promoting evaporation. Dry air warms one degree Celsius per 100 meters of elevation drop. Some of the driest places around the world exist because of the rain shadow effect. There's a rain shadow north of the Himalayas in Asia, a rain shadow west of the Great Dividing Range in Australia, a rain shadow east of the Sierra Nevada mountain range in California, and that rain shadow southwest of Mauna Kea on the Big Island of Hawaii. And here in the Pacific Northwest, we actually have two rain shadows. In winter months at higher elevations, it's not rain. Up here in the Cascades, annual snowfall is measured in tens of feet. The soaking rains on the wet side and deep mountain snows have helped shape our landscape. Sharp mountain peaks carved by glaciers and huge landslides in the lowlands, like the tragic 2014 Oso Slide, where ground-saturating rains caused thick glacial deposits from the Ice Age to unexpectedly slide into the river valley below, sweeping homes away. The rain shadow effect has been a great help to geologists in the Pacific Northwest. The Cascades have cast a rain shadow on Washington's channeled scablands, our desert landscape that has yielded so many clues about the Ice Age floods, the Columbia River basalts, and other wonders of our geologic past, just like back in Hawaii. It's all out here to see Oceans, rocks, and lava, the scenery Right here for you and me. Two minute geology.
Too many geology, too many geology. Volcanoes around the world, why are some more dangerous than others? Why are their shapes different? Why are volcanoes found in some places on Earth and not others? Volcanoes form where magma from below rises to the surface and flows out onto the surface. Lava! And those magmas form in specific plate tectonic settings like subduction zones, seafloor spreading centers, or hot spots. But that explains the location of volcanoes on our planet. Like here in eastern Washington, this lava flowed more than 100 miles from its source. But why are there different kinds of volcanoes? It all boils down to magma chemistry. Silica, a combination of the elements silicon and oxygen, controls magma viscosity. The higher the silica, the stickier the magma. Magmas around the world have silica contents that range anywhere between 45% and 75% silica. 45% silica magmas create shield volcanoes, built by the runniest lavas we have in nature. The lava flows cool to form the igneous rock basalt. 60% silica magmas create stratovolcanoes, built by alternating layers of andesite lava rock, pyroclastic flows, and volcanic mud flows, known as lahars. 75% silica magmas that flow like toothpaste create supervolcanoes with plugs of rhyolite lava that ultimately self-destruct, leaving enormous calderas up to 60 miles across. The higher the magma silica content, the more dangerous the volcano. The stiffer magmas tend to trap explosive gases, which causes pressure to build. Shield volcanoes don't trap their gases, so eruptions usually last for months and months. Stratovolcanoes erupt only after hundreds of years of pressure buildup. And supervolcanoes erupt after hundreds of thousands of years of gas trapping. Not a surprise that humans have never seen a supervolcano erupt. And there's a nice global pattern for these magmas. The low silica magmas form when oceanic crust is melted, like in Hawaii or Iceland. The high silica magmas form when continental crust is heated up, like the Yellowstone caldera in Wyoming or the Long Valley caldera in California. And the 60% silica magmas typically form at the edges of continents, at the coast, where the 45 and 75% silica magmas mix in a subduction zone, like the Cascades of North America or the Andes of South America. So is it really that simple? Well, not exactly. I mean, Mount Mazama, the famous eruption that made Crater Lake in Southern Oregon, that involved magma that was 69% silica. That doesn't fit nicely into our three groups, right? And basalt flows, coming out of shield volcanoes don't always happen in the middle of the oceans. I mean, there's the Columbia River basalts here in eastern Washington. And last time I checked, we're not in the middle of an ocean. Volcanoes around the world. It's all out here to see. Coolies, rocks, and canyons is scenery. Right here for you and me. Two minute geology. The Pacific Northwest is famous for many things, including huge floods, floods of lava that buried almost 40% of Washington, and floods of Ice Age water 
that created more than 2,000 square miles of scab lands. What are the odds that such rare events, both happened here in this corner of North America? We're just south of Lewiston, Idaho, at the mouth of Hell's Canyon, the lowest point in the state. The basalt bedrock here, the floods of lava, came out of deep cracks that formed in response to a heat source that's now in the state of Wyoming. A flood of water from a giant lake in Utah came all the way through southern Idaho, through Hell's Canyon, dropped rocks here, and the water made it to the Pacific Ocean. A giant lake in Montana flowed to the Cascades, got backed up to here, each of these layers representing a separate flood. The Columbia River basalts, the Bonneville flood, and the Missoula floods. Let's dig in together and learn about huge floods in the Pacific Northwest. The Ice Age floods have helped expose an incredible pile of lavas from erupting volcanoes that are not related to our famous Cascade volcanoes. The Columbia River Basalt Group, a pile of lava rock more than two miles thick, is an exception to the global rule. Basalt lavas usually erupt in ocean basins, but these low silica lavas flooded North America from below, much like a boat with a leak. There are similar flood lavas in central India, southern Brazil, southern Africa, and central Siberia. In each case, very large volumes of fluid basaltic magma erupted rapidly from cracks in continents to form sheets of lava rock covering tens of thousands of square miles. The deep cracks, called fissures, cracked the North American crust in southeastern Washington and eastern Oregon starting 17.5 million years ago. Today, many geologists agree that the fissures are directly related to the birth of a tectonic hotspot beneath southeastern Oregon 17 and a half million years ago, and now located underneath Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming due to the North American plate slowly moving over the stationary hotspot. These spectacular basalt lava eruptions, more than 300 distinct events punctuated by thousands of years of quiet between each lava flood, flooded and buried the rugged inland landscape of the Pacific Northwest. Many of the biggest lava flows made it from their fissures near Idaho all the way to the towering cliffs of the Oregon coast. At Pasco, Washington, the stack of Columbia River basalt lava flows is 16,000 feet thick, more than three miles of lava, sitting on top of a 17 million year old landscape. There isn't one vista to see all the lava flow layers. How could you? To truly grasp the scale of the lava stack, one has to visit scattered canyons that expose a dozen flows at a time, like in the Yakima River Canyon in the Columbia River Gorge, or in the Grand Coulee, which was carved just thousands of years ago, not millions, by the Ice Age floods. During the Ice Age, a thick ice sheet covered much of North America, advancing and retreating in response to changing global climate. In Washington, Canadian ice crossed the border in different places. West of the Cascade Range, the Puget Lobe filled the Puget Lowland with 3,000 feet of ice above present-day Seattle, with the enormous erratics left behind after the ice melted back. Most Puget Sound residents live on complicated sets of Ice Age deposits, glacial till, glacial outwash that reveal ice on the move, advancing and retreating, with glacial lakes riding the front of an active ice margin. East of the Cascades, the Okanagan Lobe crept into north-central Washington. Gorgeous glacial moraines and impressive glacial erratics have been sitting on the Waterville Plateau for at least 12,000 years. During some of the Okanagan ice advances, the mighty Columbia River was diverted and sent due south 
through the Grand Coulee and over Dry Falls. In northern Idaho, the Purcell Lobe combined with the rugged topography of the Bitterroot Mountains and blocked Montana's Clark Fork River near present-day Sand Point, Idaho. Glacial Lake Missoula formed as glacial meltwater backed up behind the ice dam forming a huge lake more than 3,000 square miles of western Montana. Old shorelines of the lake are visible above the University of Montana. Faint watermarks first noted in 1886 by T.C. Chamberlain. The lake was 950 feet deep at Missoula and up to twice that depth in neighboring valleys. And then it happened. Glacial Lake Missoula breached the ice dam and raged across eastern Washington through the Cascade Range and reached the mighty Pacific Ocean up to 10 cubic miles per hour a rate ten times the combined flows of all the rivers on planet Earth surged through Eddy Narrows and other narrow valleys in western Montana. When the huge lake suddenly drained, giant current ripples were created on the lake's floor. And the failed ice dam was replaced by a new one and another glacial lake Missoula formed, which led to the next Missoula flood. Drama repeated many times. Banded deposits at the bottom of Glacial Lake Missoula show the lake formed dozens of times and released quickly over Washington each time. Rinse and repeat up to 100 times. These are slack water sediments from the Missoula floods. We're in Tammany Bar just south of Lewiston, Idaho. Each of these is a separate Missoula flood. We're 150 miles upstream from Wallula Gap. That means water from Montana made it to Wallula Gap and had to back up this far up the Snake River drainage. This is one event, silt falling from the bottom of Lake Lewis, and another flood and another flood. Now that's amazing. Meanwhile, another Ice Age flood, the Bonneville flood, happened around the time of Missoula flooding. Lake Bonneville, an Ice Age predecessor to the Great Salt Lake, filled and spilled out of Utah and into southern Idaho. The old shorelines of Lake Bonneville, ancient bathtub rings above Salt Lake City, were first described by G.K. Gilbert in 1890. A desert underwater. Once the Bonneville Basin was filled to capacity, 17,400 years ago, erosion of loose rocky material at Red Rock Pass led to the rapid lowering of Lake Bonneville, and the Bonneville flood surged north into Idaho's Snake River Plain. Unlike the Missoula floods and its ice dam, the Bonneville flood involved a lot more water than the biggest Missoula flood, probably about twice as much water. But the constriction at Red Rock Pass that it spilled out through was much smaller than where the ice dam was breached in northern Idaho. The Bonneville water came out slower. So while the volume of Bonneville water was twice as large as the largest Missoula flood, the peak discharge was only about one-tenth of the largest Missoula flood. Each Missoula flood lasted for days. The Bonneville flood lasted for weeks gorgeous deposit. All these rocks were deposited by the Bonneville flood. Just one flood, right? Just a few weeks. All these rocks were dropped 17,400 years ago. Sitting on top are Missoula flood sediments. There are 20 different Missoula flood layers here. So at this spot, we had 20 Missoula floods after the Bonneville flood. So how do we know this stuff? Carefully crafted geologic maps made in the field by generations of geologists have measured both the erosional chasms cut by the floods and have cataloged piles of rocks and layers of sediment that the floods have left behind. Water is scarce here in eastern Washington today. It's a desert. But the landscape has a strong stamp of water and lots of it. The Ice Age floods tore up the crust, revealing the Columbia River basalt lavas that flowed millions of years earlier. 
effect, leaving dramatic landmarks like the Grand Coulee, Dry Falls, the crisscrossing flood paths of Drumheller Channels, and Palouse Falls. Tons of bedrock were hauled away by the floods as the water exploited deep cracks in the bedrock. Box-shaped valleys called coulees formed, where the most aggressive water did the most digging. Rock pre-cut and hauled off by the flood water, cruising at more than 60 miles per hour in places. And there are amazing potholes drilled by the swirling dynamics in the flood water. Often revealed in the vertical coulee walls cut by the erosive ice age floods, lost worlds hidden in basalt bedrock. At the bottom of key lava flows, pillow structures, where lava battled lake water and petrified logs, provide detailed clues to the ancient forests and lakes that thrived in eastern Washington during the thousands of years between devastating lava floods that repeatedly buried a vibrant, thriving ecosystem in thick lava. A landscape full of life, with each lava burial creating a lifeless, featureless moonscape. Millions of years later, each of the 100 floods made it to the Pacific Ocean. But does that mean that each flood maintained a high speed from Montana to the coast? No. Like today, there are many obstacles to negotiate on a journey from the Rockies to the Pacific Ocean. The Ice Age floods had the same roadblocks. Wallula Gap, the eastern gateway to the Columbia River Gorge, was a bottleneck for the floods. Every drop of Ice Age flood water needed to squeeze through the gap which was the secret passage through the Cascades and on to the Pacific. At Wallula Gap, flood water waiting to enter became Lake Lewis. The bigger the flood, the larger the Lake Lewis. Calm and dirty brown with suspended luss, which crept up neighboring river valleys, the Yakima River, the Walla Walla River, and the Snake River. The water of Lake Lewis must have gotten clearer with each passing day, the fine grain material falling out of the lake and onto the lake bottom. The result? Impressive layers of slack water sediment, each layer from each Lake Lewis. And the surface of Lake Lewis was full of icebergs. How do we know that? There are large erratics all across central Washington that mark spots where the icebergs drifted to the edge of the lake. Upstream, some of the largest Missoula floods came down the Columbia River over Wenatchee. And downstream from Wenatchee, West Bar is a classic location to ponder the speed and depth of the floods. You old enough to remember the media frenzy over Eva Knievel's daredevil jump over the Snake River Canyon? That's the canyon that the Bonneville flood the one from Utah flowed through. Remember Lake Bonneville spilling over Red Rock Pass and into the Snake River drainage of southern Idaho? The flood scoured canyon walls and gouged holes in the canyon floor, creating Shoshone Falls and Twin Falls. The water ripped through the narrow reaches of the canyon, dislodging basalt boulders and tumbling them downstream. Where the flood channel widened, the boulders were heaped into impressive piles. The Bonneville Flood then entered Hell's Canyon, the deepest canyon in North America, before joining the channeled scablands of eastern Washington. The deposits left by the flood give us rich detail. Giant flood bars, more than 100 feet above today's Snake River, sit in narrow stretches of Hell's Canyon, showing us where the flood got choked up, creating flood stages hundreds of feet high behind it. And slack water sediments are found all through the Bonneville flood route. But not the repetitive slack water sediments like the Missoula floods. Remember, there was just one Bonneville flood. All told, 100 different layers of slack water sediment have been documented in eastern Washington. 100 Missoula floods. But there is work yet to be done. What's the age of each flood? is a more complete record of the Ice Age flood sitting in the Pacific Ocean at the mouth of the Columbia River. And with the floods of lava, why did such pure oceanic lava flood a continental scene? And how did the lava stay molten for 300 miles? 
much yet to be determined with our huge floods in the Pacific Northwest. The Columbia River Gorge, a wonderful place for many things. There, sure, it's windy out here and there's scenery, but there's also incredible geology. So many different kinds of things to look at that prompt so many questions. How long has the gorge been around? How did it form? Has the Columbia River always cut through the Cascades to the ocean? The rock layers in the walls of the Columbia Gorge. What kind of rock? Where did the rock come from? And why are the layers flat in some places and tilted in others? What does the tilting tell us about the history here? Where's the Bridge of the Gods? That sounds like a cool place. How about Celilo Falls? Why are there so many waterfalls in the deepest part of the gorge? What about Beacon Rock? or the old scenic Columbia River Highway. And I get this one a lot. The Ice Age floods that many people now know about coming from Montana, did those Ice Age floods create the Columbia River Gorge, blast a hole through the Cascade Range on the way to the Pacific Ocean? There's so much to study out here. Let's get busy, question by question, figure this stuff out. The Columbia River and its tributaries have drained a large section of North America for millions of years. Where the river cuts through the Cascade Range? That's the Columbia River Gorge, the state line between Washington and Oregon. How long has the gorge been here? How did it form? It's the only passage through the mighty Cascades. You might be scratching your head thinking of ways that the river could break through the mountains, but actually, the river is older than the mountains. The Cascade Range is not just a pile of lavas. Plate tectonic uplift formed the Cascades that we know today. 3,000 feet of uplift in the last 3 million years. Uplift during the Ice Age. But the Columbia River has had a much longer history in this region. Starting 17 million years ago, the Columbia River basalts flooded the inland Pacific Northwest with hundreds of thick lava flows that came from deep cracks in the crust, up to 200 miles east of the Columbia River Gorge. Lavas that have nothing to do with the Cascade Volcanoes. Back then, there was an ancient Columbia River Valley, 60 miles wide, kind of like today's Willamette Valley in western Oregon. And the Cascades in those days were low, a modest upland with occasional volcanic cones. The Columbia River basalts used this early valley through the low Cascades to get all the way to the Pacific Ocean. We know this by carefully studying the lava bedrock in the walls of the gorge. Part of a wide swath of mostly Columbia River basalt layers found through this stretch of the Cascades. The thicknesses of individual lavas are remarkably constant from Idaho to the Oregon coast, which means they were flowing over a landscape that was pretty much flat. No major cascades at the time, no big gorge. But today, in the heart of the gorge, the Columbia River basalt are thousands of feet above the river. Why is this? What happened? Plate tectonic uplift an uplift that created the modern Cascades. Remember, 3,000 feet of uplift in the last 3 million years. And the Columbia River 
cutting against the uplift, made the gorge that we know today. The regional arching of the bedrock layers was so extreme that we have a rare glimpse at the rock layers below the basalts. Deep in the Cascades, the Eagle Creek formation is exposed. Hundreds of feet of volcanic mudflows, lahars, pieces of petrified wood, and volcanic blocks from eruptions 20 to 30 million years ago. So the Columbia River Gorge that we know and love is geologically pretty young, cut in response to an Ice Age uplift episode. And that means the dramatic vegetation changes through the gorge, created by a rain shadow effect, is also a recent development. Have you driven through the gorge lately? There's a pretty amazing change, isn't there, from one end of the gorge to the other? It's certainly not all like desert stuff that we have in eastern Washington. You drive the gorge from west to east and you experience a change of 100 inches of precipitation down to 10 inches annually in 80 miles. A wet set of plants down to desert plants with windsurfing and kitesurfing in the transition between the two extremes, all created by tectonic uplift. The Columbia River itself had different courses in the broad valley it followed through the old low cascades. There are very clear snapshots in time to confirm this. One of the Columbia River basalt lavas, the Priest Rapids flow, was liquid and hot when it came out of deep cracks in Idaho 15.2 million years ago. The flow developed great columns in eastern Washington where the land was completely flat back in the day. But as the lava approached the low cascades, the lava found a river valley with an ancient Columbia River in it. Like filling a mold, the lava funneled into the valley and eventually hardened into basalt. At the Dalles, the Priest Rapids flow is mostly pillow lavas as the lava battled water in the channel. Lava versus water is always dramatic, like in Hawaii today. Long after the lava hardened, the old valley walls weathered away, and the Priest Rapids basalt shows us precisely where the Columbia River flowed exactly 15.2 million years ago. And the best place to see this intracanyon flow? Crown Point. The Vista House sits on top of 600 feet of a Priest Rapids lava flow that once upon a time flowed through an ancient Columbia River valley. Each lava has a unique set of minerals and isotopes, a chemical fingerprint used by geologists to follow the flows across the northwest. Other lavas show different snapshots in time where the Columbia used to flow, all within the broad valley long ago, with some of the larger lava flows making it all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So did the Ice Age floods make the Columbia River Gorge? The answer is no. Remember, the river was here before the modern Cascades and the mountains uplifted against the river to make the gorge. But the Ice Age floods did leave their mark. The famous Ice Age floods impacted much of the Pacific Northwest over the last two million years. An ice dam in northern Idaho created Glacial Lake Missoula. Repeated failures of the Purcell Ice Lobe meant 100 Missoula floods across eastern Washington. And one truly impressive flood from Utah, the Bonneville Flood, followed the Snake River in southern Idaho, cruised through Hell's Canyon, and entered the Columbia River at Pasco, Washington. A temporary backup, Lake Lewis, formed at Wallula Gap, the eastern gateway to the Columbia River Gorge. Every Ice Age flood passed through the Columbia River Gorge on its way to the ocean. The biggest floods through the gorge? An estimated 10 million cubic meters per second. That's 300 times greater than the largest historical flood on the Columbia River. The highest trim line at the Dalles is consistently at 960 feet elevation. And a bit downstream at Rowena Point, the floods really ripped into the bedrock. There's scab lands here, like out in eastern Washington. Classic features due to Ice Age floods erosion. The scab lands at Horse Thief Butte are particularly impressive. Giant potholes and a basin and butte topography. 
and some of the largest floods overtopped a river parallel ridge on the Oregon side. Giant flood bars were deposited, tons of rocks dumped in quiet spots south of the river. Radiometric dates from material within the giant deposits means there's a long history of Ice Age flooding here. Not just floods since 18,000 years ago, which is the time frame usually presented to the general public. So did the Ice Age floods cruise through the gorge at maximum speed? And what's with all those tilted layers of bedrock? The tilted beds of the Columbia River Gorge are from plate tectonic forces applied to originally flat bedrock layers. But be careful, these tilted beds are not related to the cascade uplift that we talked about earlier. Instead, the Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt, a family of folds and faults in central Washington, intersect the gorge. The crust of the Pacific Northwest has been slowly rotating clockwise for millions of years into a non-rotating northern Washington and Canada. The result, anticlines and synclines, reverse and thrust faults, they all formed from crustal squeezing, warps and cracks in the crust that formed after the Columbia River was established here. You want proof? The Columbia River makes an abrupt turn at Rowena and cuts right through the Columbia Hills anticline. You can't do that unless the river was here first and the ridges came second. In the middle of the Dalles syncline, a broad downfold, volcanic mud flows of the Dalles formation are preserved. It's not all basalt around here. But here's a key point. The Yakima folds and faults have made narrow constrictions for the river to flow through. Wallula Gap was not the only choke point for the floods on their way to the Pacific. Many prominent valley constrictions exerted significant control on the Ice Age flood hydraulics. Wallula Gap, Rowena Gap, Bingen Gap, Crown Point. The water accelerated to 60 miles per hour at these bottlenecks, but just downstream from each constriction, giant flood bars composed of loose rocks that the floods dropped as the water spread and slowed. The whole town of Lyle, Washington sits on a flood bar downstream of Rowena Gap. The bar used to extend across the mouth of the Klickitat River. The Mosier flood bar sits where Ice Age flood water diverted up a side valley. The town of Bingen sits on a huge flood bar downstream of Bingen Gap. And on an even larger scale, much of East Portland sits on a huge Ice Age flood bar downstream of Crown Point. Now, for all those questions about specific attractions in the gorge, iconic images of Native Americans harvesting and processing salmon at Celilo Falls, where can I find those falls, you say? Before they closed the gates on the Dalles Dam in 1956, Celilo Falls was a majestic place. When the river was low, Celilo had a sheer drop of 18 feet. In the reach downstream, narrow chutes were separated by large holes in the river bottom. Holes 130 feet deep, drilled by the Ice Age floods. That's 100 feet below sea level. The set of rapids, the Dalles of the Columbia, dropped the river 80 feet in 12 miles, and immense salmon runs fought their way up through the falls and chutes. Celilo Falls is no more, buried under still water behind the Dalles Dam. Downstream, where the river passes through the center of the Cascades, there's a very different reason that the river is choked down here. Lewis and Clark in 1805 took note of large stands of partially submerged tree stumps, a submerged forest of the Columbia, trees up to 25 feet tall, thousands of drowned stumps upriver as far as the Dalles. And Lewis and Clark were about to encounter a set of rocky rapids here, the Great Chute, they called it, the Cascades of the Columbia. In this same spot, Native Americans spoke of a bridge of the gods, a legend of river crossing without getting feet wet, and not an ancient legend, fathers voyaging upriver in their canoes without obstruction as far as the Dalles of the Columbia. What happened here? 
an enormous landslide, the Bonneville landslide. Part of the Washington side of the gorge slid down and buried the Columbia River channel with 300 feet of loose rock. The slide pushed the river a mile south towards Oregon, making a landslide dam three times higher than today's Bonneville Dam. And above the slide? Impressive cliffs. The headscarp of the slide where the mountains split. Upstream of the slide, the river rose 40 feet. The Lake of the Gods extended tens of miles upstream. Today's Skamania Lodge would have been lakeshore property. The lake eventually overtopped the rock blockage and drained. After cutting a passage through the slide down to its current bed, the rapids first made their appearance. Lewis and Clark's Great Chute Rapids? Boulders from the toe of the Bonneville landslide. Rocks too big for the river to flush through the gorge. Later in the 1800s, locks were built to negotiate the rapids, the landslide blocks. Today, the rapids, as well as most of the Cascades locks and canal, are underwater, drowned in 1938 by the reservoir behind Bonneville Dam. So what's the age of the Bonneville slide? It was before Lewis and Clark, right? Before 1805? Maybe the slide was triggered by the great magnitude 9 earthquake that struck all the Pacific Northwest on January 26, 1700. Tree rings were counted in cores from 50 living trees growing on top of the landslide. The result? Nope, not from the 1700 quake. These trees are as old as the mid-1500s. And radiocarbon dating from the submerged trees gives us mid-1400s as a confirmed date. So the Bonneville landslide, the Bridge of the Gods, they blocked the Columbia River around the year 1450 A.D., more than two centuries before the Great Earthquake and more than three centuries before Lewis and Clark. So what triggered the Bonneville landslide and so many other prehistoric landslides on the Washington side of the gorge? The bedrock is the answer. 700 feet of Columbia River basalts overlie 900 feet of Eagle Creek formation, layers of volcanic clastics and mud flows. All of those layers tilt south toward the river. A well-greased skidboard where rainwater penetrates the cracked basalts and concentrates at a clay layer. Landslides in the Columbia River Gorge are part of the past and our future. The layers still dip, the clay is still there, and it still dumps rain in the heart of the gorge. Continuing downstream, another familiar landmark, Beacon Rock. Hey, is this one of those inter-canyon flows? No. Beacon Rock is an 850-foot-high remnant of an eroded volcanic neck that's only 57,000 years old. Think today's Lava Butte in central Oregon, a volcano that formed in the middle of the river. Lava would dam the river on occasion, but the volcano was no match for the river. And back in the early 1900s, Henry Biddle built steps to the top. Walk your family up the center of a volcano. The glorious waterfalls in the gorge, Multnomah Falls and others. Why are there so many here? They are primarily the result of Ice Age cutting by the Columbia River against the uplifting Cascade Range. The gorge cutting prompted landslides from the Washington side to push the river to the south side of the gorge, which repeatedly undercut thick, stubborn, older Columbia River basalts. The Ice Age flood swept through the gorge on occasion to clean up the walls, but the waterfalls are really a direct result of tectonic uplift. After all of this geologic history, and after Lewis and Clark, European-based settlers began arriving. The Oregon Trail approached the gorge from the east, and the old Moody Road was a primary route along the southern edge of the Columbia River. The heart of the gorge lay ahead, a giant obstacle, how to proceed? The wagon trains decided, well, are we going to get wet by following the river? Or are we going to stay dry by climbing up and over the Cascades near Mount Hood? The Dalles up ahead became a major stop for the Oregon Trail travelers to ponder that question. Decades after the Oregon Trail, early steamboats cruised up and down the river. 
And then in 1915, the first successful highway to cross through the Cascade Range, the Columbia River Highway, was constructed to harmonize with the beauty of the gorge. Graceful sets of curves, separated by viaducts, bridges, tunnels, all faced with natural stone, worked by European masons. A brand new vista house presided over an amazing landscape suddenly accessible by automobile. With the grand opening of the highway in 1915, a young geologist, J. Harlan Bratz, was hired to write a roadside geology guidebook. His first taste of deposits and landforms that got him thinking for the first time about huge floods of water from a then unknown source. A controversial topic that initially brought him scorn and ridicule, but eventually brought him fame and acceptance worldwide. Of course, the wild Columbia River was tamed in the 20th century to harness the power of the river. A continuous string of reservoirs ending at tidewater at the foot of Bonneville Dam. Today, the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, with the Discovery Center in its hub, is famous for its hundreds of hiking trails and gorgeous wildflowers. The National Scenic Area designation allows for preserving the scenic quality by regulating land use and development and through property acquisition. All of this geology has forced barges, salmon, railroads, and highways through this narrow slot through the Cascades. Geologist Jim O'Connor has devoted many years to advancing our understanding of the geology of the Columbia River Gorge, and his work is not done. By dating various young lavas that came into the gorge at various elevations, like the pillows in the freeway road cut just west of Hood River, we can improve our grasp of the timing of the Cascades' uplift and the river's downcutting. More work is also needed on the history of river blockages here, so many lava dams and landslide dams through the history of the gorge. How did those blockages affect ancient fish populations? Stay tuned! Like all branches of the sciences, there are always new questions that geologists will work to answer. An awe-inspiring place the Columbia River Gorge, a beautiful geologic laboratory for all to enjoy. This is Missoula and the campus of the University of Montana, a terrific setting in the Rocky Mountains, and ground zero for much of the water for the Ice Age floods of the Pacific Northwest. Let's tell the story in a nutshell and then explore old shorelines, high energy gravel deposits, and delicate silt beds that all tell the incredible story of Glacial Lake Missoula. During the Ice Age, the valleys of western Montana were filled with 1,000 feet of fresh water. Glacial Lake Missoula formed due to an ice dam in northern Idaho, the Purcell Trench Lobe, that blocked the Clark Fork River and its tributaries across the border in Montana. The ice dam area, which we know today as Lake Ponderé, was 2,000 feet high, 30 miles long, and sealed off a mountain valley creating a backup of lake water 200 miles to the east. Like filling a bathtub with the drain plugged. A massive lake with long fjord-like arms. A southern arm that sat in the Bitterroot Valley to Hamilton below Trapper Peak. An eastern arm to Drummond. A northern arm into the Mission Valley and the Mission Range. As the water deepened behind the dam, the pressure built against the ice sheet. Eventually, the ice was no match for the massive volume of water in the lake. The dam failed quickly. The lake drained quickly, just a few days, to drain and rush over the floors of the Clark Fork River and Flathead 
River Valley. The water barreled over eastern Washington, leaving deep cuts in the desert and moving tons of rock from the Rocky Mountains into Washington and Oregon. And that was one Missoula flood. But it happened again, at least twice, probably dozens of times, possibly as many as 100 times. The Purcell Ice Dam reformed, another glacial lake Missoula, and a new Ice Age flood burst through Idaho when the lake reached a critical depth. Rinse and repeat. The floods took different routes based on their size and local conditions. In the channeled scablands of eastern Washington, thick deposits of loess, wind-blown silt, were swept away. A surprising amount of basalt bedrock was removed by the Missoula floods, leaving impressive box-shaped canyons like the Grand Coulee with dry falls, fields of giant current ripples, huge potholes drilled into the bedrock. My God, how big were these floods? Regardless of size, each flood put on its brakes at Wallula Gap as the water funneled through the narrow gateway to the Columbia River Gorge. That was Lake Lewis in southern Washington, a brief delay before the now dirty brown water continued on through the Columbia River Gorge and on to the Pacific Ocean. Okay, that's the story. It's almost impossible to believe, right? What can we find in western Montana to prove that Glacial Lake Missoula really existed? Let's start with the obvious. Ancient shorelines, strand lines, benches on the hillsides created by wind blowing across the surface of the old lake. Tells us the water was a thousand feet deep here. But there's not just one old shoreline, there are dozens of them. Different lake levels. For the Montana valleys that had Glacial Lake Missoula in them, the old shorelines are best seen on northwest facing slopes. Like the hillside, above the University of Montana. The Big M, above campus, 620 feet above the town of Missoula. This is only two-thirds the way to the top, the high water mark. The highest strand line is more than 300 feet above us. Hiking up this slope, you might expect real obvious notches, benches, cuts, dug into this slope, but they're subtle. These old shorelines are more obvious from a distance than hiking right on top of them. T.C. Chamberlain was the first geologist to note these faint watermarks in 1886. He had read reports describing Scotland's parallel roads of Glen Roy and correctly interpreted the elevated shorelines here in Montana. Each glacial Lake Missoula strand line was created by lake waves eroding into the hillsides. But shorelines are also places of deposition. Beach gravels have been found, little beach berms. So far, no preserved organic carbon or other datable materials have been found at the old shorelines. So telling a decent story here is difficult. Missoula, the Big M, above campus, the strand lines on the hillside. Even though we don't have specific dates, most geologists agree that the highest strand line is the oldest lake. That the strand lines get younger as you go down the hill. The thinking is, if there was a young lake up here, and then you drain the lake, wouldn't you wipe out all these older strand lines? That's the thinking. Older, highest, younger, lowest. Yes, that's the thinking, but without datable material, even the most basic questions remain. Is each level a different glacial lake Missoula? Or is this one lake with periodic lowering or a combination of the two somehow? Without dates for each shoreline, it's still unclear. The highest strand line is at 4,200 feet elevation on a steep hill slope exposed to more than 10,000 years of thunderstorms, it's pretty amazing how little eroded these strand lines are. At its maximum, Glacial Lake Missoula had a surface area of 3,000 square miles. The northern shorelines of the lake sometimes had an ice margin. 
Ice calved off into the lake. Icebergs with big rocks in them that set sail for various destinations in the lake. Large boulders show where the big rocks fell off their ice rafts. Drop stones, back when the water of Glacial Lake Missoula was relatively calm and quiet. Up north, impressive white lake beds were laid down close to the ice margin. Rock flower, silts created from the grinding power of the ice sheet to the north. Wildlife and dusty white deposits everywhere. The drain was plugged, the lake was big, and the white silts collected on the quiet lake floor. But there are also deposits that speak of tremendous high energy events. Mud is usually at the bottom of lakes, right? You swim in your favorite lake, that means dark mud is oozing up between your toes. But at the bottom of much of glacial Lake Missoula, deposits of rocks, not mud, dominates on the valley floors below the strand lines. Why? I'll bet you know why, right? High energy water is recorded in these valley of bottoms. That's what the rocks are telling us. But when Glacier Lake Missoula was here, it wasn't high energy, it was low energy. The water's just sitting there and layers of mud and silt are being deposited at the bottom. But when we break the ice dam, that water starts moving quickly, fast enough to erode all those soft beds at the bottom. And in their place, a big batch of river gravels were brought in from elsewhere and sit at the bottom, deposited during the high velocity flooding. Rocks the size of my fist or my head are even bigger. So when we look down the guts of the Clark Fork River Valley, it's high energy river gravels in the bottom instead of the mud. Okay, make another ice dam, make another lake, Lay down more silts and muds. That's fine. But when we break that ice dam, the water's on the move and we erase those and bring in more river gravels. All told, we have more than 300 feet of big flood deposited gravels at the bottom of the Clark Fork River Valley. How many floods does this represent? Under the tranquil scene of trees and flowers, the marbles from high energy floods. The fastest water probably peaked in the first few hours during the ice dam collapse. The high energy gravels are piled thick in places where the water slowed right after being shot through narrow valley bottlenecks. A giant flood bar at Tarkio, hundreds of feet high and more than a mile long, is composed of fist sized rocks. In other places, water speeds were fast enough to pluck car-sized boulders from very hard bedrock. Not enough to convince you? Still not sure that Glacial Lake Missoula drained in a hurry? Well, how about these? Giant current ripples formed on the lake floor as the lake drained quickly. At Camas Prairie, individual ripples are 35 feet high and spaced 100 feet apart. Cobbles and pebble gravel shaped into these impressive forms that developed under more than 200 feet of water moving up to 60 miles per hour. Joseph Pardee was the first to study these more than 75 years ago. Four sets of ripples sit below four separate spillways above Camas Prairie. Western Montana's bedrock is different than Washington's flood scoured basalt. Glacial Lake Missoula sat in sedimentary bedrock created more than one billion years ago. It's pretty easy to visualize where the lake rushed out of Montana. Today's Clark Fork River flows in the direction that the Missoula floods flowed. Rugged, vertical walled canyons like Eddy Narrows were particularly energetic spots for the flood water. Pockets of flood gravels remain stranded high and dry inside canyons. Gulch fills help show the depth and the speed of the water as it ran the gauntlet downstream to Idaho, Washington, and beyond. The deepest glacial Lake Missoula was just a few hundred feet shy of spilling over the Bitterroot Mountains at Lookout Pass, where Interstate 90 crosses the Idaho-Montana state line. 
Instead, the lake drained through the Bitterroots using existing river valleys to the north, and once into Idaho, the flood swung to the southwest over Spokane and the broad openness of eastern Washington. So much field evidence for Glacial Lake Missoula is visible from I-90 between St. Regis and Missoula. At the exit for Nine Mile Road, one more very important study site. These are famous silty beds west of Missoula, partly because we're still debating the significance of them. These are rhythmites. There's 40 of them here. With that zebra striping, what's the story? Why are these delicate silts still here if this is a place where high energy flood water was cruising through? These repetitive layers of silt and mud contain details with important clues. But debate continues on what these layers are telling us about Glacial Lake Missoula's history. Even the terms are confusing. Rhythmites, varves, are they the same thing? Not here at Nine Mile. Interstate 90, from the freeway, you can see the rhythmites. Dark, light, dark, light. From the freeway, those are the zebra stripes. But within one dark zebra stripe, Varves at a tinier scale. Dark light, dark light, those are annual patterns. Dark light couplet, that's one winter summer pattern. Varves, rhythmites. Many geologists see the more than 500 varve couplets here as annual layers, like counting tree rings in the mud. But not everybody agrees that these tiny layers are annual. Why not seasonal storms, they say, or occasional debris flows into the bottom of the lake? But the tiny layers are so clean, some people say. Not a root, not a leaf, not a twig, not a gopher hole, no tracks, no cut and fill gullies, very little organic carbon. At least everybody can agree that dark zebra strikes, the dark rhythmites, were deposited at the bottom of Glacial Lake Missoula. The dark bands are mud, the light bands are silt, and the rhythmites get thinner and thinner toward the top. But that's it for agreement. What do the light-colored silty rhythmites really tell us? Do they record lake drainings or lake fillings? The nine-mile rhythmites sit on top of the high-energy gravels that we talked about earlier. It's looking like the coarse gravels not these delicate rhythmites, are the record for the truly huge floods, the big drainings of Glacial Lake Missoula. But how many big floods? It's pretty tough to tease out individual huge floods from a big pile of marbles. With so much water speed, it seems unlikely that these soft beds would survive, especially since they sit in the area's most deeply scoured canyon stretches. Are these beds at nine mile from the last and smallest glacial lake Missoula? Almost an afterthought in the Ice Age flood story? A progressively smaller Lake Missoula toward the end of the Ice Age is consistent with these rhythmites that progressively thin up section and have decreasing numbers of varves per zebra stripe as you head up the slope. And that agrees with the strand lines getting lower and lower with time above Missoula. Each successive thinning ice dam existed for less years, resulting in a lower ancient shoreline. Flood magnitudes must have decreased through time, but did each dam collapse completely with each big flood? Or was there a slower release of water that somehow tunneled through the ice sheet? Did each glacial lake Missoula drain completely? Are partial lake drains even possible? It's tempting to correlate the rhythmites of Glacial Lake Missoula with northern Washington's Glacial Lake Columbia and southern Washington's Lake Lewis. Are these the same beds? Is each rhythmite from a major Missoula flood from Montana? Was each flood from Montana? Are there other potential sources of water to the north? Bed-for-bed -bed correlation is almost impossible due to differences in the character of the sediments. The varved muds at the bottom of Glacial Lake Columbia show many, many years of lake water due to the Columbia River being blocked by the Okanagan Ice Sheet, 
a different plug, a different bathtub. And at the bottom of Lake Lewis in southern Washington, no varves at all. The lake down there lasted just a few days at a time. That bathtub had an open drain, Wallula Gap. Emerging dates do seem to suggest that some of the huge floods struck earlier in the Ice Age. We just don't have enough dates to tell a more complete story. Not yet, anyway. Answers will come from the next generation of field geologists. New dates are trickling in. Surface exposure dating techniques are being used now on basalt bedrock and coulee walls and on the surfaces of erratics sitting in Washington's channeled scablands. As more dates emerge from across the Ice Age floods country, some of the mysteries that remain will be solved about Glacial Lake Missoula. Ideally, with new techniques used by future geologists, new dates will come from the floor of the old lake and maybe even from the strand lines up high above Missoula. Glacial Lake Missoula, where it all began and where unsolved mysteries still remain.